Welcome to Rogue Trader. Please read the disclaimer and remember that prices can go down as well as up. ITM Power represents a clear solid play on the potential for governments using hydrogen power their renewable energy strategy. So hydrogen production is probably a key part of being carbon neutral by the year 2050. This would mainly be in the form of where there's excess electricity in the grid you could use these electrolyzers to convert that into hydrogen, which can then be placed into the UK gas network for heating fuel. Situations like with wind turbines, which are producing excess electricity at any given moment, that excess electricity can also be converted into hydrogen. So this is the story of where um, ITM power electrolyzers could be a key part of this green future. ITM Power have actually only recently built what they call their Gigafactory and this is based in Bessemer Park in Sheffield and here they're co so this so what's what makes this so what makes this company stand out is that they really are actually got they have actually got a tangible factory and they are actually manufacturing and selling electrolyzers which puts them far ahead a lot as of a lot of the other renewable plays that we've been looking at they just raised 150 million uh, but they have a 30 million cash burn but still they've got plenty of cash to see them through the next three or four years so really the use case for them is in the manufacture of hydrogen and this can be done either off the grid or next to where you have wind turbines that are producing that are producing excess electricity. The, the this hydrogen can then either be used for transport, so where you've got buses and uh, trains and stuff running on hydrogen. It can also be pumped. The hydrogen can also be just pumped directly into the UK ga gas mix. So we currently use methane gas. And you could have a proportion of that of hydrogen. So that's also a effective way of using this hydrogen that's been made where there's excess electricity. And also there's industrial uses for hydrogen. So hydrogen's used already in oil refineries and in ammonia production and steel making. And so there's use cases of taking hydrogen made from the ITM electrolyzers to be piped into these industrial processes. And finally, hydrogen could potentially become a export industry in itself. It could become a commodity in itself that's being exported. So, for example, in uh, British Columbia, they have excess renewable resources and there's talk of potentially them exporting hydrogen around the world a bit like how liquid natural gas is exported currently. So here's four key projects which ITM Power are involved in. So, so ITM Power are in partnership with Shell and um, they have this, this project called Refine. So the Refine project is a huge oil refinery which Shell operate in Germany is part of the Rhine Valley and they are actually building this um, or they've actually built this 10 megawatt electrolyzer which looks kind of nice in that image there and here we've actually got the EU commissioner being uh, shown around the uh, wearing a shell jacket so uh, that's quite ironic really um, obviously shell being you know, being the uh, mongers of a dirty oil refinery, <laughs> but because they're because this is a green hydrogen project, they've got the EU commissioner walking around in a um, a shell outfit. So that was a this is a project that seems to have been such successful in demonstrating how ITM powers electrolyzers can be used for the manufacture of green hydrogen rather than using grey hydrogen which is where they reform methanol into hydrogen which is what has been done before but for hydroploy they're showing whether it's possible to pipe hydrogen into the current gas network 
so here you can see this rather small scale unit they have where they're using grid electricity to convert water into hydrogen and then pumping that hydrogen into the uh, gas pe gas pipe works and we know that the um, everyone at the Keele University campus is using this uh, blend uh, with hydrogen in the methane for their heating gas mobility this is where they have hydrogen refueling stations uh, shell garages and various other locations it's mainly actually uh, bus it's mainly buses that are fueled on hydrogen so a few bus depots and um, but there is also a small amount of um, hydrogen fuel cars and a network of hydrogen supply for that throughout the UK and finally Gigastack so Gigastack is a very interesting project um, where they have these um, we have the Horn C2 offshore wind turbine project that's run by Orsted and this is um, obviously because it's wind there's often excess electricity that's not actually needed um, yeah because when the wind blows isn't always when the electricity is needed so the idea is to tap some of this unneeded electricity and use a ITM electrolyzer to convert that into hydrogen that's then going to be used in this uh, Philips oil refinery so what you can say for ITM power is although most of the work so far does have government subsidy there is certainly a, you know a lot of the pieces of the, jig, of the jigsaw coming together in terms of real proper uses of this technology you know you certainly can see the roadmap here and if we look at the share price we see that it was flat for many years and then it's just gone ballistic ever since 2019 going back to 2016 and this is where we had the high deploy project announced at Kiel University and uh, we now have first hydrogen at, at that project um, they had a 5.7 million capital raise in 2017 and this was when the uh, Shell Refine project was announced and then not really that much news into 2019 but this is when it all starts happening they announced the Giga factory in 2019 part of this was the Hornsey 2 Giga stack project so this Hornsey 2 Gigastack project was um, where they start having large, they start talking about large 10 megawatts electrolyzers. In late 2019, they have this massive announcement where they form a partnership with Linda. Now Linda are the, uh, one of the huge, one of the largest hydrogen producing and largest gas companies in the world. Uh, you'll know of them through Bock Gas in the UK, but Bock Gas, which were huge, are now only a subsidiary of Linda. And this really is a massive deal for ITM Power. To have someone like Linda behind you is very impressive. Linda actually invested 32 million in ITM Power in late 2019 as part of a 59 million capital raise and Linda actually put one of their own directors on the ITM Power board so a massive news really for ITM Power there and then in 2020 Linda put money where their mouth is with a 24 megawatt project being announced at their Luina complex and I think that's producing hydrogen for industrial purposes also the Hornsey 2 project the Gigastack project this now has moved on to phase 2 development work and um, and ITM power have been awarded 7.5 million for that so here we've got them um, potentially then if that's successful they'll be building a 100 megawatt stacks for industrial use and this is converting electricity 
direct from wind turbines to industrial use in an oil refinery, at a oil refinery. Then, in, uh, then later in uh, 2020, SNAM, uh, a partnership with SNAM is announced. And this was part of a 172 million capital raise with, STAM, with SNAM making a 30 million investment. So SNAM are actually one of the largest Italian companies there are and the world leader in energy infrastructure. So we can see how SNAM is again an amazing strategic partnership for ITM Power. And, you know, it really does bode well for the future, this partnership. So the, STAM, the SNAM partnership really does bode well for the future. Also in uh, 2021, we had their interims and a, a very good investor announcement, a investor call, which I watched. And this was actually held from the Gigafactory Productions now begun at the Gigafactory and in 2021 it was announced a new 5 million EU grant for a turbine study where they're actually going to be putting a electrolyzer at sea on a offshore turbine. Also they're talking about using it for uh, water desalination so for example in the Middle East you could have an offshore wind turbine that's piping clean water desalinated from the seawater and electricity and hydrogen. But really the bulk of the news was in uh, 2020 and that's where we see from uh, 20, end of 2019 this massive increase in the share price. Now for my Greta Gold series I've been looking at all these renewable plays and a lot of them we saw this same pattern where in 2020 the prices of the shares go shooting up and um, so I think this was not only an ITM power thing this was like a sector wide thing now of course at the end of 2019 we had the EU announce their Green New Deal and so this was some massive news right at the end of the 2019 and then at the end of 2020 Boris Johnson committed a trillion pounds to dealing with um, making a, a green renewable future and, and basically being carbon zero by 2050. And of course, we have Joe Biden. And at the end of 2020, Joe Biden committed to spending two trillion on all of this new renewable energy projects to become carbon neutral by 2050. So all of this green renewable future news really came together through the course of 2020 and we see this massive boom in share price but unfortunately this leaves me feeling like I've missed the gold rush the time to have gone in would have been here now perhaps we've missed the gold rush we're not getting a good price anymore so having done the groundwork there's a nice story here with ITM power and a lot of tangible things happening that make them look good, we immediately see some kind of ugly things. As soon as I go to the profit and loss, things start to look a bit unpleasant. So their revenue is actually fairly stagnant now at 3 million. Um, although the analyst estimates that the, that's the revenue is going to increase to actually up to 80 million by 2023, over the last five years, the revenue is fairly stagnant. And actually, there was a sales drop in 2020, which was blamed on COVID. And then in the 2021 interims, sales were down 92% to only 200,000. And again, it was blamed on COVID. So this doesn't look good. But they are moving into their new factory around this time. And their operating profit is really bad. I mean, look, it's now at uh, minus 29 million in 2020. And yet this really does not look good. The worrying thing is that their direct costs are so high up to now 11 million. 
this means that they're actually selling their electrolyzers at a loss. I took a look at direct costs and these are basically they've got their raw material, you know, they've got their product that they're making in their factory, their electrolyzers, and the direct costs are the cost of the things that go into making these electrolyzers. So that's the raw materials, paying the wages of the guys in the factory, paying for the costs for running the factory. These are the direct costs. And unfortunately, their direct costs are more than the money they're getting in for selling the electrolyzers. So they really are currently selling their electrolyzers at a loss, even before you go into other costs like R&D, sales and marketing and this kind of thing. So we see here graphically how their net income really is collapsing down here and a really nasty widening. And so when you're buying this stock, it certainly isn't into the, um, the performance of their sales over the last five years. You're hoping that in the future, if they achieve greater than 80 million in revenue, then they'll start having a positive net income. You'll see these narrow and they'll start having a positive net income. Now, hope for this comes in their sales pipeline. So their, their actual um, current tender pipeline is approaching 450 million and their current sales backlog, so that's actually secured contracts, is around, well, it's above 100 million. But it's a bit unpleasant that the actual, um, actual sales seem to have remained glued to the floor even though the tender the tender pipeline and backlog have gone up we have here the analyst estimates in the dotted blue line i use data from hsbc to get these analyst estimates and it is reasonable to assume that their sales could go up to 50 million to 100 million there's a fairly long lead time. You're talking three, four, five years for this to happen. But you can say that although it looks like a train wreck now, there is potential for them to be having a more healthy operating profit when we go into the future. At, the, at their most recent analyst call, they said that it would be 2024 before they were in positive cash flow. So... It's a train wreck now, but there is the, you know, there is evidence there that they are going to turn this around in a few years time. But you're definitely not buying shares in them at these prices based on the current net income. So looking at their assets and debt, and there's not really much here other than that the um, they've had increase they've obviously built this big factory and so they have more asset long-term assets in terms of their property plant and equipment they have quite a lot of cash now in their 2020 they had 40 million but following the fundraise they now have 187 million of cash so they're flooded with cash at the moment that's a positive and they have no long-term debt the only long-term liabilities are the lease liabilities. When I look at their statement of cash flows, they look like any kind of upstart company. There's loads of cash that's come in from their issuing of shares. There's, they're actually at a loss from their normal operations to the tune of 12 million. And other than that, really their main other cost is CapEx investment. So they're totally, in terms of their cash flow, loads of cash coming in. But in terms of the real business operations, they're losing money. Their equity is actually mainly share premium accounts. So that's basically them just issuing shares and selling them in capital raises. And their retained loss, you see, is ever increasingly negative, which then is a drag on their overall equity. You can see here in the graph, um, you can see here how 
as they lose money year on year, this retained loss ever increases. And um, this is, like I say, they're like a an upstart company, speculative company um, relying on issuing share capital. That's this share premium account here. And that's their profile. If they're a much more mature company, like a lot of the others I've been looking at lately, then you see this retained loss. Eventually they become money making and then it's retained earnings becomes a higher proportion of the overall equity and the share premium account becomes less significant when i compare them against afc energy and series power holdings the first thing is none of them have a price to earnings ratio that's because they're all loss making so you can't have a p to e ratio um, and then for price to book ITM Power is definitely more expensive than the others, but I think that reflects that they've got more substantial stuff going on. Now, looking at their market cap here, they really are horrendously overvalued, or they appear horrendously overvalued. Now, here's a similar chart that I did for Southern Scottish Electricity, and you see how the market cap is so much more grounded to reality with the net assets and the um, net income. Now that gives you a good comparison to the situation with ITM Power, where you know it would have looked a lot more normal down here. And then as soon as we got into the gold rush, and of course the news stories that they had, boom, you know, their market cap appears sky high. Now currently their market cap is 2.5 billion, but their sales were only 3 million. So according to Reuters, that gave them a price to sales ratio of 2,662. That is just ridiculous. What I've done is um, they obviously, they've not got a price to earnings now because they don't make any money. But what I considered was if these analyst estimates were correct and then they started making money, in around four years time then if they were achieving a, a, a 30 million net income that would that's this lower bar here you'd still it would still look crazy at today's share price but that would be a price to earnings ratio of 93 if their current gigafactory was working at full capacity then we could expect, so I know, I know that they get half a million per megawatt. So we could expect like um, half a billion in sales, if that was the case, which would be up here. And then it would be reasonable to expect, a um, by my very rough calculations, that they'd, they'd, be made, they'd be having a net income of, let's say, 500 million. Then they'd have a price to earnings ratio of six to one then their current share price would be reasonable. So you've kind of got, in terms of their valuation, a bit of a Tesla story where they're saying that their future growth is going to be exponential. The market believes that it's going to be exponential. But all the same, if you're investing in them now, you're believing this Tesla-esque story that uh, five to 10 years from now, that gigafactory is gonna be working at full capacity. And at, in fact, they've already said that they're, they're planning to use the money from this 172 million capital raise to build a second gigafactory. This is actually their stated company policy. But the question is, do you believe in these share prices? Do you believe they're going to achieve that? You know, is this story and this roadmap going to continue developing at the same pace and become exponential? So looking at the sector, so what I did is I looked at ITM Power, AFC Energy and Ceres Power. They're all fairly similar in their models, what they're doing. What I did is over the last 20 years, I tracked their market capitalization, which is actually quite difficult to get the data to do that. 
And um, what I've found is actually, here's the FTSE in the lighter blue color. And actually these companies that are all in the same sector, they, their share, their market cap, sorry, the money flooding into these companies, it actually just mirrored the investment in the FTSE 100. And then um, in the, all until 2019. And of course, 2019 is when we have all these this new stories beginning. And then you see it shoot up across the whole sector from 2019 to 2020. So this just tell us that this jump up, you know, a lot of that could be just mania, renewables, mania, Greta Gold. And this is kind of a warning signal to me that I have missed the gold rush. So generally, I really like ITM power. To me, they are a clean play onto the renewable story, onto the zero carbon story. They're a way of, they're a way of getting hold of all these government subsidies and maybe in the future, if the government skew it that way, there'll be a lot of money here. But I just wanted to investigate a bit further the renewable hydrogen story. And here we see renewable energy in the UK. And it's quite clear that most of it is wind energy. And um, that makes sense because obviously solar panels in the UK are a stupid idea. I don't care what anyone says. It rains all the time in the UK, so that's obvious. But um, wind is an excellent idea because it always, you know, we always have really horrible weather in the UK. And in fact, having done a bit of research, I can tell you with authority that the UK has the best wind resources in the in Europe and maybe even in the world so it does make perfect sense that the UK concentrates on renewable energy and when we look at the makeup of UK electricity generation we see that wind is what's being developed and we know that the government has said they want to double it again you know so so wind makes perfect sense and really the story is going to be about reducing the natural gas and replacing that with wind. Now, of course, um, the problem is, is when we look at the overall energy use in the UK, a lot of that then is oil. So, you know, so we can see, so we see how. Yeah, so we can see how wind energy is going to replace this nasty natural gas. But then that means that in overall, we have a problem of this nasty oil still. So then that's where they're going to um, be introducing the use of electric cars to replace the internal combustion engine. And then also, um, we've got, still got the problem that natural gas we can replace that for um for electricity production but it's still used to to heat houses in the uk so this is where hydrogen comes in because now also by the way um the by switching to using electric vehicles then this is this is forecast to at least double and maybe triple the electricity load on the UK grid. So we're going to have a situation with loads of wind turbines and loads more electricity demand. So where hydrogen can play a part is that, um, yes, it could be used to power lorries and trains and buses. And we do see some of that in the roadmap of ITM power. But also all this extra wind turbine is gonna create lots of un excess electricity because you have the electricity at the wrong time. So it does make perfect sense. Things like the Gigastack project make perfect sense to me. It really does make perfect sense that you're gonna have a lot of these wind turbines that excess electricity is going to be converted to hydrogen. 
And then also um, where you have excess electricity, you know, you can have, uh, you can use the conversion of electricity to hydrogen to be pumped into the natural gas network in the UK. That can be used also to balance the grid. And then we have the situation where hydrogen from these other sources is going to be blended into people's heating gas to lower the, um, you know, the, the amount of nasty methane that's used. It does, you know, I do feel I start to begin fairly confident in ITM Power's roadmap. Okay, so what I also did to help further investigate the place of hydrogen in the future was I looked at National Grid and a lot of the data they've been coming out with because it's very important to National Grid. So National Grid are responsible for the UK electricity and gas network. And so obviously they're a great place to look at to, to see look, really where does hydrogen play in the future. They're very adamant that they think hydrogen is going to be playing a big part. And they've got this future energy scenarios document they put out where you can go onto it and you can click on different things and it tells you different um, potential outcomes. Now, one thing I can say about the national grid information is that currently there's zero hydrogen use in the UK energy demand sector. So, yeah, you see zero energy in 2019. And then what you can also say is depending on which scenario plays out, there could be either hardly any hydrogen being used or loads of hydrogen being used. So it's kind of, it's uncertain. There's a risk factor if you're investing in ITM power. But what is for sure is hydrogen does seem in the forefront of the entire electricity grid network experts' minds. And it does seem also, I can say, at the forefront of the UK government's minds in terms of achieving net zero by 2050. Say is that for some scenarios, actually the worst case scenario, they actually tout methane reforming as a solution. So that's where you uh, convert methane into hydrogen. And that then would actually be a competitor to ITM Energy. So it's worth pointing out, you know, there is potential for for the um, the ITM powers electrolyzers not becoming a commercial thing in the future. There is potential for that. However, the majority of their scenarios do involve electrolysis. Some like this one hardly any. Some some like this one quite a bit. So you would see it being perhaps 20%, electrolysis being perhaps, um, you know, maybe 20% of the overall energy story. So there is also a potential for ITM power being the next Tesla, if you like, in, in terms of the way that the demand means they have to scale up the production of their product. You can see here how, you know, it's quite clearly in the government blueprint and in National Grid's blueprint, the idea of using electrolysis to produce hydrogen for grid rebalancing and for, for use in residential heating uh, by piping the hydrogen and mixing that with uh, natural gas and then also for industrial processes and for grid rebalancing where where there's often an excess in the grid and the grid's going to be a nightmare to control with all this renewable energy um, so they can help smooth it by converting excess electricity into hydrogen and by piping that hydrogen into the uh, UK heating gas network. So in the end um, I highly recommend you go and look at the latest ITM Power investor call where their CEO I found was very impressive in how he explained a lot of the questions that were asked. 
it gave me a really good insight into how I think hydrogen is likely going to play an important part in what the UK government's dead set on doing to become net zero by 2050. To me, I think there really is a big use case for their products and all the bits of the jigsaw are coming together. I like how, I really see how all of these proof of concept projects can convert into a company that's making a lot of money from selling electrolyzers in the future. Unfortunately, I feel like I'm too late to the party. Um, I've missed the gold rush. There was a Greta gold rush here and I'm too late for it. I feel like I'm at Harrods. I can see the product I want to buy through the window pane and I'm just staring at that product. But unfortunately, I know I just can't afford to buy it. However, having researched them, I'm definitely now a ITM Power fanboy. Here's my watch list and I've added them to it. And uh, what my plan is, is, I mean, I know that it's, we're talking, when we look at their sales, there are huge lag times here. We've had a, a massive load of money rushing into this corner of the room in terms of the renewable sector. And you always get, there's always a chance for pull down when you get so many people running into the room at the same time. So I'm just going to cross my fingers. Um, we're talking about a five to 10 year story here. So maybe in the next five to 10 years before this company becomes fully established, there will be an opportunity where their market cap becomes more ground to earth. And I'll be standing by hoping for that moment. If I was to go into them, then my exit strategy would be to hold on to them until the company matures. And in terms of risk profile for anyone who's already in them at the moment, their risk, uh, their risk things to look out for would be that hydrogen doesn't become part of the carbon neutral story um, as anticipated. So you could see that happening if, if none of these things that are going on at the moment none of that starts happening commercially um, then in the future you know and if itm power just aren't selling anything commercially five years from now then there's your warning sign um, if they can't that ties in with this as well um, that they don't achieve full production capacity so so you want to be keeping a close eye on itm power's tender pipeline the backlog and the analyst, you know, and their sales. And if you don't see this trend rising up and you don't see their factories reaching 70, 80% capacity, then that's a good way of knowing um, that this company is just not going to fly on its current um, market cap. And cost of goods. Again, it's possible to look at their direct costs and get an idea, um, you know, when the costs per unit go down, when they're in full production, then we'll know whether this is a, a you know, a product that's actually economically feasible or not. I am a ITM power fanboy, I have to say, but unfortunately, I'm just going to have to wait until the right moment with this one.